Objection, so ordered. Madam President, today I continue in my series of speeches concerning the line item veto with particular emph emphasis presently on the history of the Romans. Now, why am I uh, doing this? These speeches don't make any headlines. My staff doesn't rush out with press releases. They're not expected to, uh, to make news. I hope, Madam President, by these uh, speeches, to enhance the understanding and the appreciation of all those who will listen, members of the Senate, members of the House, representatives of the press, and uh, the public in general. I hope to enhance their understanding of the importance of maintaining a legislative branch that is free of domination from an all-powerful executive. And with a deeper appreciation of the critical role that the power over the purse plays in the constitutional mechanism of separation of powers and checks and balances that was handed down to us by the constitutional framers in Philadelphia in 1787. Well, why Roman history? Because uh, many, if not most, of the framers were conversant with Roman history and with the history of England. They were also very conversant with Montesquieu, whose political theory of checks and balances and separation of powers influenced them in their writing of the Constitution. And they knew that Montesquieu was, was also influenced in his political philosophy by the history of the Romans and by contemporary English institutions, by English history. Matter of fact, Montesquieu wrote a history of the Romans. And so, Mr. President, Madam President, I proceed then with another in my series of speeches on the overall subject of the line item veto. In 509 BC, the Romans switched from a king as the executive to the election of two consuls as dual e executives with equal powers, both to be elected at the same time, each to be elected for, for a one-year term, and each having a veto over the other consuls actions. To avoid an overuse of the veto, to avoid its being too frequently applied, the two consuls alternated from month to month in taking charge of the administration when both were in the city. And when both were in the field with the Roman legions, they held the chief command on a day-to-day -day basis, alternating from day to day. Thus, we see that the duality and the working together the cordiality represented by two consuls constituted the Roman answer to 
any possible threat of a return to monarchical rule. In addition to the two consuls, we noted uh, last week the development of various other magistracies. Today I would like to add three. The Interrex, the Master of the Horse, and the Proconsul. The Interrex was an individual appointed by the Senate upon the death of a king with provisional authority to rule until another king was chosen. And later in the Republic, an interrex was appointed when both consuls died or resigned, their seats were vacant. And he was to rule with the imperium, the authority of a consul. He was to have 12 lictors who would escort him. The interrex had to be a patrician and he had to be a senator. They were appointed only for a few days at a time, five days, 10 days, so on. The master of the horse was nominated by a dictator who under the Roman constitution could only serve a maximum of six months or until his task was done, which, whichever was the lesser. The master of the horse was nominated by the dictator to serve as his, the dictator's subordinate. He could take the place of the dictator in the field or in Rome. The, imper the imperium of the master of the horse was a de derivative of the dictator's imperium. And the master of the horse ended his commission when the dictator laid down his office. Now as to the proconsul, in 327 BC, Quintus Publilius Philo, a consul, was besieging the city of Naples and was about to take it when his term, his one year term of office came to an end. What was to be done? He no longer had the authority to command the army. The Roman people voted his continuing imperium for no more than a year or for such time as he completed his task, whichever was the, the lesser. So that his command of the armies, his imperium, his office of consul was continued temporarily into the next year, 326 BC. So it meant that he was consul for a time after his office of consul had expired. Madam President, uh, we also observed the development, the origins, and the functions of the various assemblies of the people. We knew that there was a Roman Senate and that it had existed since the earliest days of the king. But what about the people's assemblies? We have two assemblies. We have two, two bodies here. We have the Senate. We have the House of Representatives. Well, from the era of the kings, the, there was an assembly of the people. The first assembly was the commissia, meaning assembly, the, commence, the commissia curiae, made up of the the curie. Then there was the Comitia Centuriata, which was an assembly of centuries. 
Then the Concilium Plebis, or a council of the plebeians. Then the Commissio Tributa, the tribal assembly. And in each of these assemblies, the convening of the, assemb the assembly had to be by a magistrate. The assembly could only vote up or down on the subject matter presented to the assembly by the convening and presiding magistrate. The assembly could not amend the proposal. And the Senate could veto the actions of the assembly. In order for the actions to become law, they therefore had to have the ratification or approval of the Senate. The Senate, therefore, was supreme. We saw that in the fourth century, the plebiscite of Ovinius, a Roman tribune, was enacted. It presented uh, a list of regulations, a formulation of the regulations, by which individuals would be enrolled into the Senate as members thereof. It gave to ex-magistrates preference. So by law, the censors who, who enrolled members into the Senate were required to give precedence to worthy ex-magistrates in the enrollment in the membership. Now, what does this mean? Well, this meant that the exercise of excessive personal or factional influence over the composition of that body, the Senate, was curbed. It also meant that the guarantee of a future Senate, for, uh, a future seat for life in the Senate, was an incentive to every magistrate to do his best during his tenure of office, to act honorably and to serve effectively uh, so that he would be considered an individual of worth when his term of office ended and thus be eligible for enrollment as a member of the Senate. It also meant that the Senate, indirectly albeit, was popular, popularly elected because it was made up of ex-magistrates who had had to stand for election. before entering upon their various offices. The consuls, the censors, the praetors, the questors, and so on. It also meant that this Senate, being a body of ex-magistrates, would be a gathering of the wisest men in the, in the government. They had held high administrative positions in the government, or they had commanded armies in the field, or both. What a Senate. The Senate had the power, it held the power over the purse. It was supreme in financial matters. It regulated the coinage. It supervised the revenues and the expenditures. It controlled the aerarium. The aerarium was the state treasury located in the temple of Saturn below the capital in the care of the questors. And in the aerarium, 
or the silver and the gold ingots, the bronze lumps and bars, and after 269, the Roman coins that were made of silver and bronze. Other tribes, some of the other tribes, had proceeded with the manufacture of coins before the Romans did. Also in the aerarium were the papers, the documents of state. An archive of the files of papers. It was the receptacle of the Senatus Consulta. What was the Senatus Consultum? A Senatus Consultum was the advice of the Senate to a magistrate. And in Republican times, it uh, did not have legislative force, but de facto, it was binding. I said last week that the Roman Senate met from dawn until sunset. The Senatus Consultum was crafted, was drafted after the session of the Senate in the presence of the presiding magistrate and in the presence of witnesses, including among whom, included among whom was the proposer or the author of the Senatus Consultum. The Senatus Consultum contained the name of the presiding magistrate, the date, the place of assembly, the terms or a substance of the Senatus Consultum. It indicated the number of senators who were present when the Senatus Consultum was approved. It also gave the names of witnesses to the drafting of the Senatus Consultum. And it included the capital letter C, meaning the approval of the Senate. The Senate had given its approval. Now as I look at our very attractive shorthand reporter here this morning. I remember that Plutarch said that before the consulate of Cicero, Marcus Tullius Cicero, there were no shorthand writers. Cicero lived between 106 BC and 43 BC. But Cicero had recruited a number of the swiftest writers and had taught them the art of abbreviating words by characters. And he placed them in various parts of the Senate House. And these records were filed in the Herarium. Mr. President, uh, from the very earliest times, the Romans seemed to be incessant, incessantly involved in fighting battles with neighboring tribes and sometimes not so neighboring tribes. From time to time, they would lose a battle. But they always won the war. One such battle was the Battle of Cardine Forks in 321 BC. 
It was during the Samnite War. Gaius Pontius was the general who was leading the Samnites on this occasion. The two Roman consuls were Titus Venturius Calvinus and Spurius Postumius. These two Roman consuls were, and, the, and their armies were fighting the Latins, the Campanians, and the Vals, Valsians. The Roman armies were on their way to Luceria. There were two routes by which they could go, but the Samnite general lured them into choosing the shorter and the more dangerous of the two routes. The route that they chose led through two gorges, steep, wooded, and narrow. And between the two gorges, there was a wide, grassy plain. And the road ran through the center of this valley. The Romans passed through the first gorge and emerged into the valley. And as they proceeded to the second pass, they found it blocked by a barrier of large rocks and fallen trees. And at the head of the pass, they noticed some armed men. And it was apparent that they had fallen into a trap. They quickly retreated to the other gorge from which they had entered into the valley. And they found it by then likewise barricaded with rocks and with armed men. Every effort to extricate themselves was, uh, was in vain. Finally, their supplies ran out and they were driven to attempt to make a, a reasonable and honorable peace the two consuls consulted with Gaius Pontius, the general, the enemy general, who stated that he was prepared to make a treaty if the Romans would uh, vacate Samnite territory. The two consuls insisted that they were not authorized to make a treaty without the approval of the Roman people. And so the Romans were ordered to leave and to lay down their arms. The two consuls were ordered to dismiss their lictors and to remove their cloaks, their generals' cloaks. Then the two generals were forced to walk under the yoke. The yoke was two spears erected vertically a few feet apart and with a third spear across the two upright spears. This was the yoke. And uh, the legions made up of 20,000 Romans were forced to march under the yoke. And they had to bend to go beneath the yoke. And they were stripped of every bit of clothing except a single garment. They were forced, therefore, to walk half naked naked beneath the yoke, while on each side the enemy soldiers were armed and stood there cursing and taunting the Roman legions as they marched beneath the yoke. The expressions on the faces of the Romans, imaginably were expressions of humiliation, embarrassment, the expression of capti captives. And they entered the city of Rome far into the night and stole away each to his own house. And the next day, not one of them ventured forth into the forum 
or into the public streets. It was, it was a terrible defeat for the Romans. But as Montesquieu said, the Romans never seek peace except as victors. And they always increase their demands in proportion to their defeats. The more disastrous they defeat, the more the stakes went up. The more the Romans increased the ante, the more they increased their demands on the enemy. They were an indomitable people. And so the Samnite Wars, which uh, continued sporadically from 343 B.C. to 290 B.C., ended with the Romans victorious in 290 B.C. It was apparent then that the Romans, having conquered, conquered the Samnites, who were an ancient people in southern Italy, living in the Apennines, it was apparent that the Romans, who then controlled the territory from the Gallic north to the Greek colonies in the south, intended to extend their sway throughout the whole peninsula. The rich Greek city of Tarentum resented the penetration of the Romans into southern Italy. The Romans had uh, established a garrison at Thurium, not too far away from Tarentum. And the Romans enhanced that garrison by providing a squadron of 10 galleys to cruise in the Gulf of Tarentum. One day the Tarentines saw these galleys at the entrance of the port in the Gulf of Tarentum. The Tarentines uh, immediately manned their own vessels, went out and attacked the Roman squadron, destroyed four of the galleys, took one and butchered the crew. And uh, emboldened by this seemingly easy success, they then went down and drove out the garrison from Thurium and plundered the city. Shortly thereafter, a Roman ambassador, Lucius Postumius Megellus, appeared and demanded reparations. He had been sent by the Senate. The Tarentines, the Tarentines gave him an audience in the theater. And in speaking, he used such Greek as he could command. He didn't do very well with the language. And each time he would place the wrong accent on a word, the Tarentines would burst out in, in a laugh. And when he remonstrated, they laughed all the more. They called him a barbarian. And at last they hissed him off the stage. And as the grave Roman senator retired. A Tarentine who by his constant drunkenness had been nicknamed the Pint Pot 
came up to Postumius with gestures of the grossest indecency and bespattered the senatorial gown with filth. Postumius turned to the multitude and held up the bespattered gown as though appealing to a universal law of nations. And at this sight, the Tarentines burst out in even greater laughter. And they set up such a loud laugh as shook the theater. Posthumius paused. Men of Tarentum, he said, laugh. Laugh now. It will take not a little blood to wash this gown. The Romans, by the way, that uh, incident, that, that incident is mentioned in one of Macaulay's lays of ancient Rome. The Romans then advanced on uh, Tarentum. The Tarentines invited Paris, a very able Greek general, to descend upon Italy. Paris was king of Epirus and was the most able of all of those who claimed to be the heirs of Alexander. His words when he saw the encampment of Romans were full of meaning. These barbarians have nothing barbarous. in their military arrangements. So he sought to negotiate with the Romans. He proposed that if they would leave free Tarentum and the other Greek cities, if he would restore to the Samnites, the Apulians, the Lucanians, and the Bruttians, the cities and the lands which the Romans had taken from them, he then would offer to enter into an alliance with the Romans. But the Romans repelled every offer. Paris had brought with him 20,000 men, well-trained, and well-trained in the Macedonian battle formation. He had also brought 20 elephants. And the Romans were not prepared for the onset of the elephants. This is the first occasion on which elephants had been seen on the Roman peninsula. Alexander had encountered elephants in his battles with uh, Darius Darius III at Issus in 333 BC and at Arbila, sometimes referred to as the Battle of Gogamila, in 333 BC, 331 BC. But this was the first time. And so the Romans, as I say, were not prepared. The battle was lost by the Romans. Paris won, but at great cost. And at the conclusion of the battle, he exclaimed, such another, vac such another victory, and we are undone. He had, in crossing the Adriatic, uh, counted on an easy war. Instead, he had met with the most redoubtable adversaries. 
So he renewed his peace proposal. He offered again the same proposals, but this time he added a provision that he would free all Roman prisoners without ransom. And Sinius, the philosopher, was sent by Perius to submit the proposals to Rome. Sinius spoke before the Roman Senate. He had brought with him bribes for Roman senators and rich robes for senators' wives. But he found no takers. Found no one venal. But he made an eloquent speech to the Roman Senate. Paris him said that the eloquence of Sinius had gained for him, Paris, more cities than had been gained by arms. Sinius had almost persuaded the Roman Senate to accept the peace proposals by Paris. When the news came to the ears of a man who had been censor, consul, praetor, interrex, dictator, Appius Claudius Secus. Appius Claudius Secus is a renowned Roman who has been compared to the aristocratic founders of Athenian democracy. When he was a uh, censor in 312 BC, he enrolled in the Senate several persons of low birth, plebeians, the sons of freedmen, he did this in order to get their votes, their support for his plan to build a highway, the Via Appia, into southern Italy. And his plan to construct the first aqueduct, first aqueduct, the Appia, the Aqua Appia. The cardinal point in the cardinal feature in the policy of Appius Claudius Secus was to enlarge Roman control over the entire Italian peninsula. So when he heard that the Romans were in the Senate were about to be convinced by the silver tongue of Sinius, he had his servants carry him to the Senate house, whereupon his sons and sons-in-law led him into the Senate. He was old, he was blind, and when he went into the Senate, he was met with a silence of respect. He said, as related by Plutarch. Hitherto, I have regarded it as a misfortune to have been blind. But today, Romans, I wish that I were as deaf as I am blind. For then I would not have heard the sh Shameful reports. Of your counsels and decrees that are so ruinous to the glory of Rome. You tremble at the name of Paris. Do not expect that if you enter into an alliance with him that you will rid yourselves of him, because that will be a step in opening the doors 
to many invaders. For who is there who will not despise you and think you an easy conquest if Paris not only escapes punishment for his insolence, but also gains the Tarentines and the Samnites as rewards for his insult to the Romans. Tell Paris to leave Italy, then we will talk with him. And when he concluded his speech, the senators voted unanimously to continue the war. And they told Senius that if uh, Paris continued to stay in Italy, he would be met with a continuing force. He would be pursued with force even though the Romans were to suffer 1,000 of Livinius' defeats. Livinius having been the Roman consul who had defeated at uh, Heraclea. So they gave Cinius his orders to, to leave town that day after they had levied two additional Roman legions right under his eyes. Cinius was impressed. The sight of this great city, its austere manners, and its uh, patriotic zeal struck Cinius with admiration. And when he had heard the deliberations of the Senate and observed its men, he reported to Paris that here was no mere gathering of venal politicians, no haphazard council of mediocre minds, but in dignity and statesmanship, veritably an assemblage of kings. This was the Roman Senate. He told Paris that it would be a mistake for, for Paris to continue in this war with the Romans because they were in such great numbers. They could cr create new legions so fast that Pyrrhus would find himself engaged with, an, with a war, in a war with the Lernaean Hydra, which was a serpent or monster that lived in the marshes near Lerna, Lerna with nine heads. And every time Hercules cut off one head, two more appeared unless the wounds were cauterized. Well, Paris fought a second battle at Asculum with the Romans in uh, 279, 279. The Romans again were defeated with great losses on both sides. But in 275, the Romans defeated Paris at Beneventum. And he returned to e Paris with only a third of his Expeditionary, expeditionary force. In 272, Tarentum fell, was conquered by the Romans. And with its fall, the Romans, who had built that little fledgling city on the banks of the Tiber 500 years before, now control the entire peninsula 
from the Po Valley in the north to the Ionian Sea in the south, from the Tyrrhenian Sea on the west to the Adriatic on the east. What was the secret of their success? Well, of course, the major secret, and there were several secrets of their success, but the one which I will mention today was their superior military system. The consuls commanded the armies in the field. The consuls might not have been always great or even good generals, but they were always soldiers of experience. Because it was a requirement for the candidate for office in Rome during the Republic that he had to have a record of at least 10 military campaigns. And the subordinates of the consuls, the military tribunes, were also veterans because they too had experienced five campaigns or ten campaigns. But the main factor in the military success of the Romans was the iron discipline. The iron discipline that the Romans had learned first at the hearth in the home. The respect for authority. The iron discipline. The consular imperium gave to its holder absolute power over the soldier in the field. And the penalty of neglect of duty, cowardice, or disobedience was death. One example I shall mention here, it will suffice. In 340 BC, the Roman armies were fighting the Volsians, the Campanians, and the Latins. The Roman armies were encamped near the city of Capua in southern Italy. The two Roman consuls were Decius and Titus Manlius Imperiosus Torquatus. The Roman consuls felt that if there ever were a time when military discipline was vitally important, it was on this occasion. Because they were fighting people who had the same languages, customs, weapons, same tactics, battle tactics. Many times the common soldiers, the centurions, the Tribunes had mingled together, fraternized together in the same companies with the enemy. And so the two consuls felt that in order to avoid confusion that might end in a terrible, disastrous, terribly disastrous error, they should pronounce an edict that no Roman should leave his rank to attack the enemy until commanded, ordered to do so by the Roman consuls. 
So the edict was issued. The soldiers went out upon patrols, reconnoitering the territory. And uh, the leader of one of these patrols was uh, Titus Manlius, the son of Titus Manlius Imperiosus Torquatus, the consul. The son and his patrol came near to the enemy, and uh, the leader of, one of the cavalry of the enemy was named uh, Geminus Machias. He saw this Roman patrol approaching. He, he recognized the leader of the patrol as being the son of the Roman consul. So he challenged Titus Manlius to fight. The other soldiers stood back. And Titus Manlius, in the anger of the moment, forgot the commands of the consul forgot the edict of the consuls and rushed forth to do battle. And the two horses rushed at one another. Titus Man Manlius charged with such force that he drove his spear into the mouth of Geminus, Machias, and it emerged from between his ribs. Titus Manlius then took the spoils of the enemy, carried them back to the tent of his father, the Roman consul. And when he had told his father, his father turned his back on his son, ordered that the trumpet be sounded to gather an assembly. When the assembly gathered, the father then turned to the son, he said, you, Titus Manlius, have respected neither the edict of the consuls nor the authority of your father. You have undermined the military discipline upon which Roman power has always depended. Because of this, it is better that we be punished for our sins than that the Republic suffer to atone for our transgressions. I am affected both by the inborn love of a father and by these tokens of your conquest, your bravery, and your courage. But the orders of the conference of the consuls must either be confirmed by your death or be forever nullified by your immunity. Go, Lictor, bind him to the stake. This was the man Manlian discipline that was so often referred to by posterity. It was a harsh discipline. but it taught Roman soldiers to be obedient to the orders of their commanders. And it was said that Roman soldiers feared their commanders more than they feared the enemy, because they knew what the penalty would be. For disobedience, for cowardice, and for neglect of duty. Now, Mr. President, with the unification of all Italy, we have brought uh, the Romans to the point where they will become increasingly involved in international affairs. But for now, let's just to reminisce for these last few minutes. We've seen a Roman system develop through
through chance, experience, trial, and error. A Roman system of checks and balances. The veto of each consul as against the veto of the other. The veto of each plebeian tribune as against the veto of the other or the others and as against the vetoes of the consuls. We have seen the origin development of the Roman assemblies. The assemblies of the people. We've also seen that their legislative actions could not become law without the approval of the Senate. We've seen the Senate as an institution that existed from the beginning, from the very first king, the legendary king, Romulus, who had appointed 100 of the wisest elderly men to the Senate. We saw its membership increase by 100 under Tarquinius Priscus. And we saw the membership increase by an additional 100 under the first Roman consul, Lucius Junius Brutus, in 509 BC. We saw the Senate supreme. We have noted that it had absolute control over the purse. We have noted that it was free from domination of any consul, free from domination by any executive. We've seen the separation of powers. The consuls, the tribunes, the questors, the praetors, the edals, the interrex, the proconsul, the propraetor, the master of the horse, and so on. Separation of powers. Some to act as judges, some to act as executives, some to act as legislators when their, act, when their work was ratified by the Roman Senate. The Senate had control over the treasury. While the assemblies declared war or peace, it was the Senate that waged the war. And we saw the Senate wage that war with the Samnites and emerge victorious. We saw the Senate wage the war with the Tarentines, the Volscians, the Samnites, the Apulians, the Lucanians, and with Paris. We saw a Senate that was made up of wise men, the wisest in the state. Wisest because they were selected through a process of experience that guaranteed that it would be a body of men who had commanded armies in the field, who had held high positions in the government. A pillar of strength. That was the Roman Senate. We saw the respect for authority and the imposition of discipline that began with the child in the family, the Roman family, in the home. Not only respect for authority, but respect for the gods, reverence for the gods. They were pagan guard, gods, to be sure, but it was a respect for the gods. We're taught to worship those gods. 
And it was that respect for authority, that discipline, and that reverence for the gods that made the Roman, that made the Roman character what it was and made the Roman so victorious. Each Roman believed that Rome had a destiny to be fulfilled. And each Roman believed that he, that it was his duty to further that destiny, the destiny of his country. We can see so many parallels in the long Roman history with our own beginnings in our own country. And as we proceed, we shall see the continuing ascendancy of the Roman state the Roman people, and then the beginning of the decline and the decline. We'll find that as long as the Roman Senate was independent of the dominance of any, bo any body of persons or the dominance of any executive, Rome grew in strength and influence. We will also see that when the Roman Senate declined and was dominated by an all-powerful executive, an emperor, and by the military, the proletarian guard, uh, not the proletarian, but the, but the praetorian guard, we will see Rome's decline. Spend now you yield the floor. I suggest that I yield the floor. <laughs>